Good morning. Today we're going to talk about respiratory tract infection, starting with URI. If a, if a, uh, if the cure is found for the common cold, we'll be sort of out of business. About half of all symptomatic illnesses you can see here. Morbidity and mortality adds a lot to health care costs. All you have to do is walk down your aisles of your pharmacy. Occasionally, these are fatal illness. And as you know, excessive use of antibiotics to treat common respiratory tract infections is a major factor in the emergence of, uh, of drug resistance. And the problem defining respiratory tract infections, the reason we tend to get respiratory tract infections is summarized here in this little diagram of the respiratory tract which makes a point the plus marks indicating colonizing organisms that the respiratory tract consists of a number of, uh, I guess, four tubes that are uh, normally sterile, the internal auditory canal, the ostia to the paranasal sinuses, and the trachea. We also have the nasolacrimal duct, which is not quite so sterile normally. And what keeps these uh, tubes sterile? The internal auditory canal, the sinus ostium, uh, and the trachea under normal circumstances. Sure, cilia propelling a blanket of mucus upwards. So that a common, fairly common scenario is that a viral infection will damage the cilia allowing these normal colonizing bacteria to infect the organism so that uh, middle ear infections will be caused by bacteria coming up that way, sinus infections, and lung infections that way. And so we get into the scenario that we summarized yesterday of viral infections typically predisposing to bacterial infections. And these are common serious problems, as you can see here. We begin with the... Uh, the common cold, which I'll say a little bit about, but only briefly, believing that the only way to treat a cold is with contempt. Most of us have them. How many of you have one right now? Several of you. You know, rhinoviruses are the most common cause coronaviruses, miscellaneous unknown viruses, streptococci can resemble it. And we found in recent years that if you do CT scans, that sinusitis is often present. So that some suggest that rhinosinusitis might be a better term for the common cold. That sinuses are often involved. And just in briefly, this is a fairly self-evident slide the symptoms of the common cold, viral infections, directly cause sneezing and sore throat by infecting the nasal cells. Also can lead to nasal obstruction by causing uh, vascular dilatation in tissue edema from increased permeability, sensitizing the airways receptors, Cholinergic stimulation, bronchoconstriction leading to cough, increased mucus production leading to rhinorrhea. So sneezing, sore throat, nasal obstruction, rhinorrhea, and cough. In the differential diagnosis of a lot of respiratory tract infections, it becomes clinically important to see whether they had a runny nose. because That does suggest the common cold. And the transmission, uh, handshake uh, transmits in less than 10% of instances but nevertheless, we feel that hand hygiene is important, which is why you're carrying some uh, antibacterial hand lotion, right? So when you shake hands with people, you won't transmit it, correct? You don't want to give your classmates the common cold. Also, you, right? Right. <laughs> 
Direct contact, as we know, is the most important thing. Kissing does not seem to be a common mode of transmission, surprisingly. And a couple of years ago, making things, uh, particularly in the era of genetic engineering, very, very frightening, was this previously unrecognized coronavirus, which had its uh, genome quickly sequenced, which uh, could cause a common cold, but you might die from it. Severe acute respiratory syndrome. Respiratory illness of unknown etiology with fever. Respiratory illness and a history of travel. And this is the hooker in terms of defining this. It looks like it can only be defined epidemiologically, right? You got it from someone else. How do you know that that's what you've got? So that is very, very scary. Then it progresses, cough, shortness of breath, dyspnea, hypoxemia, pneumonia, or the adult respiratory distress syndrome. And going to Asia, certain areas of Asia, this was a very, very scary thing. And progressing to pulmonary infiltrates, this would be an advanced case with ground glass looking infiltrate. Classically is here affecting the lower lung zones being bilateral, pleural effusions, lymphadenopathy and cavities are not seen. So just looking like a common cold that goes bad, right? And you develop a severe hypoxemia. And it's suggested that what happens is the virus begins to multiply and then you get immune hyperactivity, cytokines, and then it begins to destroy the lungs. One of my heroes in medicine is a fellow named Dr. Carlo Urbani, who was an Italian physician working with Doctors Without Borders, who recognized SARS in a hospital in, uh, in Hanoi and made the difficult decision to quarantine the hospital, not let anybody out or in. He stayed there himself, sent his wife and three children home to Italy, and he died himself of SARS. We probably prevented the disease from spreading. Very, very frightening. Any questions there about the common cold and SARS? Which hasn't yet become a problem here. As you know, it became a problem in Canada, but it's really rather terrifying, isn't it, that we could have this virus transmitted like the common cold, which could be very bad. Pass we now into some more mundane stuff, acute bacterial sinusitis. How many of you ever had sinusitis? How many of you not had sinusitis? Some of you? Uh, the question is, what is sinusitis? Acute bacterial sinusitis, same thing we talked about earlier, virus infection obstructing the ducts, compromising the mucociliary blanket, acute infections with virulent organisms, and we'll find again and again in these respiratory infections that virulent organisms, the pneumococcus and haemophilus influenzae, paving the way for opportunistic pathogens. Acute bacterial sinusitis, about one in 200 respiratory infections, more often in adults than in children. What people say is sinusitis is frequently not bacterial sinusitis. Bacterial sinusitis will cause you to have fever and a great deal of pain and a lot of us, when we have colds, we have minor sinusitis, a viral sinusitis, but not really acute bacterial sinusitis. And the sinus is by way of review. When people say sinusitis, they usually refer to people point to their sinuses. They usually point to the maxillary sinuses, right? And the ethmoids are also commonly involved. The 
fernal sinuses and sphenoid sinuses are less often involved, but are much more serious. And otolaryngologists talk about the osteomiatal complex, which is a point in which uh, the uh, ostea tend to come together in the nose, ostea to the sinus openings, and one uh, faulty aspect of our design, or so it seems, would be that with the maxillary sinuses, instead of gravitating downward, the mucus has to be propelled upwards through this fairly narrow little opening here, which is uh, one reason that we tend to get maxillary sinusitis. This is another view of the sinuses on a x-ray. Imaging procedure of choice today is CT scan. And that's unfortunate because it turns out that the sinuses uh, are maybe these handheld ultrasound devices that the first year students are being given will come into play. Uh, but a problem with the sinuses is, is, is as a clinician, it's, it's difficult to know what's really going on in the sinuses. You really have to image them. <coughs> Frontal sinus is up here. Maxillary, the ethmoid air cells. You can see their little tiny pockets. And then the sphenoid sinus sits back here on top of what? It's very near the, the, the cell of Tersica, the pituitary. And the ways that we have to evaluate the sinuses, uh, you can try to tr transilluminate with this gadget. I don't know anybody who owns one of these. <laughs> darken the room and illuminate the frontal sinuses, put it down that way, and the uh, maxillaries will show up that way. This is a normal CT scan. It's a way to look at them, showing the uh, maxillary sinuses and the osteomiatal complex, so-called. And then one classic x-ray view is the water's view of the sinuses. And this sinus has got what in it? These would be the maxillaries. Sure, it's got fluid in it, and it's got this air fluid level. And here's a coronal CT scan of sinuses showing some thickening here in the maxillaries, involvement of the ethmoids. <coughs> So as you can see, you can see a lot by CT scan that a, a clinician really has no way to see at all. The few good data about what the bacteriologist sinus, sinusitis is, and why would it be hard to get bacteriology of the sinus, sinusitis? Excuse me? How do you swab it? Yeah, how do you swab it? And even if you do swab it, if you put a swab up in the nose, the nose is going to have its own flora, right? So what does it mean? The best data of which I'm aware are shown here in which you can get data from the maxillary sinus by making a little puncture and drilling a hole through the maxilla. You know, reach up there on your gum and just imagine just drilling a hole back up in there can be done. And when this was done by people at the University of Virginia, they found that they got a fair number of viruses shown here. They got a lot of pneumococci, streptococcus pneumoniae, and a lot of H flu. They also found some anaerobic bacteria with names like the ones we looked at yesterday, Bacteroides, Peptostreptococcus, which can be looked at as an anaerobic, 
strep, infusobacterium, that gram-negative toothpick we looked at yesterday, sometimes staph aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Moraxella cataralis, when the slide was made, it was, had a different name, Branamella, and sometimes gram-negative rod. So you see that the pneumococcus and H. flu are the, are the biggies, biggies, possibly Moraxella cataralis. Complications of sinusitis, when people say that they have maxillary sinusitis, that's usually uncomplicated. Ethmoid sinusitis can rarely lead to something called Cavernous sinus thrombosis. What is cavernous sinus? What is that? Excuse me, you remember? Anatomy? Leslie knows. <coughs> Part of the venous drainage of the brain, right? Right. Good, Leslie. Uh, Fernal sinusitis can also do that and can cause osteomyelitis of frontal bone can extend into the brain. So the point is that sometimes sinusitis can be very, very dangerous. This person has ethmoid and or frontal sinusitis with an edematous eyelid. And this is why Fernal sinusitis at ethmoid can be dangerous and why you shouldn't pop a zit in this area of the face, right? You know that? Excuse me? Well, excuse me, what were you saying? Dr. Wells told me. So what did Dr. Wells tell you? Good. Don't pop a zit on your face. Right, and, th and this is why, because the, the veins in this area of the face, the so-called dangerous area, communicate back there, and, and this is a cavernous sinus, this lacy complex of veins. And notice how this is right around the sphenoid sinus. So the sphenoid sinus is uncommonly involved, but can be, as we'll see in a minute, very, very dangerous. So you can and go back there to the cavernous sinus and cause cavernous sinus thrombosis, which is real bad. This lady's got frontal sinusitis with busting of the frontal bone. Sphenoid sinusitis is rarely involved, often misdiagnosed. Grave consequences as shown here because of its intimate relationship to a number of very vital structures. I talk about infectious causes of the worst headache that you've ever had. There are only a few infectious causes of the worst headache you've ever had. And they are obviously meningitis and brain abscess, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, sphenoid sinusitis, and the fifth one will be uh, falciparum malaria. Sphenoid sinusitis. And this was a prominent Columbia gentleman who had the worst headache he'd ever had. He got put on steroids for presumed <coughs> temporal arteritis. He died of sphenoid sinusitis, and this was overlooked by the person who read that CT scan. He has a pacification of the sphenoid sinuses. Sphenoid sinusitis. And this sort of shows why the sphenoid sinus, how many of you could draw a map of Richland County? But very few of us could, could we? If you look at Richland County, the map of it, it really reminds me of the, of the sphenoid sinus as shown here with Kershaw County making a little indentation. So what sits in the cella tersica? Here, the pituitary gland. And notice how the sphenoid sinuses are in this intimate relationship with the pituitary, a bunch of your cranial nerves, and cavernous sinus, and uh, big red coming in there, internal carotid artery. <laughs> 
So the sphenoid sinusitis is, can be very, very dangerous, as you might see there. In terms of the pattern of facial of pain that you have, what, what might pain might you, where might the person complain of pain based on this? Might be facial, right, from the fifth nerve being involved. Generally, it's an all-over headache. It can be on top of the brain as well. It's been suggested, I was intrigued to throw this in, it's been suggested that in uh, our evolution that we differ from the Neanderthals and their sphenoid sinus is shorter. which affects the shape of our skull. So that's an interesting idea. Sometimes uh, sinusitis can become, why do we have sinuses anyway? Who can give me a reason to have sinuses? Right, it makes the head lighter and it gives resonance to our voice, right? The other reason I've heard. Our voice. Only two reasons I've found. Have you heard of any others? A lot of people talk about chronic sinusitis. When I, patients are referred for chronic sinusitis, usually the problem is not an antibiotic problem. It's usually it's some anatomic problem. Uh, and if you do cultures, you'll find lots of opportunistic pathogens. Rarely sinusitis can be caused by fungi. Some people will have fungal sinusitis. These people tend to have polyps in their nose, and they can get a lot of bad things happening. This is a bad case of fungal sinusitis. Sometimes it can just be a fungus ball, usually aspergillus. Occasionally certain fungi can use the sinuses as a way station to the brain and go through the sinus mucosa and then back into the brain. Mucormycosis, have you had your fungal lecture yet, Dr. DeSalvo? Rhinocerebral mucormycosis is the most famous example. There are others, chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. That does the sinuses. Any questions about the sinuses? Yes, sir. Excuse me? You mentioned the sphenoid sinus is becoming smaller to the root. I'm wondering if you said it has any advantage or not to my knowledge, no. Not to my knowledge. Otitis externa. Talk about ear infections a little bit. How many of you have ever had a otitis externa? How many of you had swimmer's ear? A couple of you have. What was it like? Hurt badly? On the back row there? Itched a lot? All right. And see, you tugged on your ear when you said that, right? It hurt to tug on it, right? So, have you been swimming, any of you? So, swimmer's ear, and one thing to do in, in going through these lectures, there's certain bugs that are going to come up repeatedly, and I may give you multiple choice exams on, to so catalog what was due to staph aureus, and what was due to strep, and what was due to pseudomonas, okay? Catalog those, especially pseudomonas. Swimmer's ear, pseudomonas. Pseudomonas is a water bug. So swimmers get pseudomonas. In the skin lecture, we look about how people who use whirlpools may get folliculitis due to pseudomonas. So put swimmers ear, acute diffuse otitis, pseudomonas aeruginosa. Localized otitis is often staph. It's like having a little pimple in your ear or strep pyogenes. Chronic 
mainly otitis media. And then there's a rare syndrome of life-threatening otitis externa, and that is essentially synonymous malignant otitis externa with Pseudomonas aeruginosa in diabetics. So mark well Pseudomonas in uh, swimmer's ear and malignant otitis externa. This would be simply a case of otitis externa. A red ear. You don't want to get your ear cartilages infected, by the way, and, and I'm sort of appalled by the number of people that are piercing their ears because the cartilages have a very bad blood, blood supply. From everything I know, you know, piercing your ears is a bad idea. What do you think? Earlobe, okay, because it's vascular, but I can't imagine wanting to pierce the cartilage of your ear or your nose for that matter. Can you? I don't notice any, I, tend, I notice medical students don't tend to have pierced ears, correct? Earrings, how many, well, I won't ask. <laughs> but I don't see many earrings in unusual places in medical students. <clears throat> we, won't, we won't look at people's navels. <clears throat> Acute localized, usually staph aureus, swimmer's ear, chronic, Otitis media, malignant pseudomonas. Malignant otitis externa, it tends to be uh, occur in diabetics, and it's been looked at as the ear equivalent of the diabetic foot. And what tends to happen is they get sort of a chronic otitis externa, the ear gets macerated, they have drops, and then it's, it's uh, posited that the <coughs> organism slips down through these little slips in the ear cartilages. The reason the ear is sort of mobile right here is because the cartilage is discontinuous. And there's some little slits called the fissures of Santorini. From there, the organism can get down and burrow down around under the temporal bone and get into the skull and, and also cause osteomyelitis of the temporal bone and the, uh, the problem is that once it gets in there, into the temporal bone, again, you've got a bunch of vital structures, including the jugular vein and the carotid artery coming down there. So that can be fatal, hence malignant. So much for otitis externa, acute otitis media may become less common with the pneumococcal and H. flu vaccines. Indeed, that's already being shown. The use of the conjugate pneumococcal vaccine in little children and the H. flu vaccine may be decreasing it because this is really a scourge of early childhood, isn't it? Between about ages two and five or six, all the little kids have red ears. Moraxella cataralis may have a, a, a role, but in all age groups, pneumococcus and H. flu being pharyngeal colonizers tend to cause this. There's a famous association that shows up on board examinations of mycoplasma pneumoniae causing a bullous meningitis. That's probably not all that common, but remember it for boards, bullous meningitis, mycoplasma pneumoniae. And The critical role here, again, going back to the little diagram with which we started, is the eustachian tube, normally kept sterile by the mucociliary blanket. We don't even realize we have it until we're descending on an airplane, right? And then we have it, and we do that, and it'll tend to open it up a little bit. Children, it is suggested, get more otitis because their eustachian tubes are shorter and wider. The skulls haven't matured. So the bacteria have an easy access. Okay, by way of review, what's that structure? That one, 
Frontal sign is good. Y'all are on top of your game today. And here we have just another summary slide. This shows bacterial causes of community-acquired respiratory infections, percentage of cultures looking at pneumonia, bronchitis, sinusitis, and otitis media. And notice that the big two are really pneumococcus and H. flu, with Morax cataralis trying to threaten, make it a big three. Then we have all kinds of other bacteria. Those are the big ones. And this shows a tympanic membrane with otitis media. Here you have the markings somewhat visible. Here you have them <coughs> obliterated. Chronic otitis media, uh, as in this earlier scenario, uh, in people who've had it, Acutely, and then it becomes chronically, we can have opportunistic organisms, including anaerobes and skin flora organisms. In the pre-antibiotic era, people frequently had, going back to this earlier slide, mastoiditis, infection of the mastoid air cells, which became a chronic, very stubborn, difficult infection, which could lead to complications, including extension to the brain. Today, that's a lot less common. Seldom seen, in fact. Any questions about ear infections? We now get into the sore throat. And sore throats are very common. How many of you have a sore throat as we speak? Yeah, I probably get two or three a year. This shows... Streptococcal pharyngitis with acute follicular tonsillitis with pus on their tonsils. This is why when, when I was little, they used to just kind of line us up, put us in the hospital and take our tonsils out. You've been spared that. How many of you still have your tonsils? All of you. Right. Rarely you can get an abscess in your tonsils, peritonsillar abscess, or Quincy, in which George Washington is said to have died, peritonsillar abscess. But this is acute follicular streptococcal tonsillitis. And a problem, of course, of differentiating strep throat from viral pharyngitis. Viral, you tend to have just edema and redness. Strep, Classically, pus, exudate, and hemorrhage. And one question that I like to ask on exams is that the mononucleosis can also uh, cause an exudate and look like pus on the tonsils. But in general, if you see, you know, see pus, that's an example that you, uh, or good evidence that you're dealing with strep and not with a, uh, a virus. But on clinical grounds, it can be tough to distinguish between a strep throat and a viral pharyngitis. Hence the business of doing a rapid strep screen or a, a culture to try to figure it out. And there are many other causes of a sore throat. Adenoviruses can so have a sore throat and sometimes you can have an exudate. Blisters in the mouth, herpes simplex, sometimes Coxsackie. Diphtheria is, I have never seen diphtheria. The key is a gray pseudomembrane. A pseudomembrane. Pink eye is, you know, is usually due to adenoviruses, and there's something called pharyngoconjunctival fever, where the adenovirus can cause a sore throat and conjunctivitis. As indicated here, it might mimic strep throat. A lot of use, overuse of antibiotics for this. Conjunctivitis, in about a third to half of cases. Medical students might get that from sharing a... Anybody? 
Microscope, maybe? Excuse me? You don't use microscopes? They don't use microscopes? Really? What about in pathology? It's all on computer? You don't use microscopes in pathology? Do you all own microscopes? Am I in a medical school? <laughs> My word, we all we had, we had to buy microscopes. Now you buy computers, I guess. Is that right? Yeah. Well, good for you. <laughs> That's probably probably better. That's amazing. How many of you know how to use a microscope? <laughs> You're not what? Herpangina, uncommon Coxsackie viruses. Children, little little blisters. Just remember that you saw the word herpangina there. It's not on my exam. For completeness, we talked about when the peritonsal abscess which can be dangerous. We'll talk about more serious infections. Vincent's angina, anaerobic pharyngitis. This is diphtheria with this uh, like the out of focus of gray exudate over the whole pharynx. And the problem with this disease is the toxin, right? Toxin that gets absorbed and go to the heart and lots of other places. Classic diphtheria, slow onset, marked toxicity. There's another one out there today, Arcanobacterium hemolyticum, rarely caused pharyngitis in adolescents and young adults with a rash on the trunk and extremities. Diphtheria. And lots of things can cause a sore throat, primary HIV infection, Gonococcal infection, gonorrhea. Findings are a lot less dramatic than they are in uh, strep throat, usually diphtheria, as we mentioned. And rarely I've never seen this, Yersinia, which we'll talk about in the diarrhea lecture. And some suggestions that mycoplasma and chlamydia, which we'll talk about in the next hour, might do this. Croup. Young children, viruses, high-pitched vibratory sounds, subglottic area, cough, can lead to respiratory failure, the croup. Acute epiglottitis is... Uh, and mark this well, the usual pathogen is H flu, epiglottitis. We're going to see that less commonly because of the H flu vaccine in children. This was a 74-year-old adult. The finding here, which you, you have to know what's normal anatomy to, to pick this up, the finding is that the, the, uh, the tissue between the tracheal air column here and the vertebra here should be very narrow. So what you see here is widening of that space, and you really can't see it very well here, but uh, the, if we dim the lights, we might see it a little bit better, but not much, I don't think. Whoops, whoop, I hit the wrong thing. I shut down the projector. We had a look. Who was the projector operator? My word. Okay. It gives a thumb sign. <laughs> we had the air shadow, and it gives a little thumb sign like that. The epiglottis is, uh, is swollen. 
Any questions so far? Okay, who can sing the USC alma mater? <laughs> We're now going to talk a little bit and to close this hour and get you out right on time. Uh, some of the deep fascial space infections of the head and neck. And did you have to hit lights? If you hit the lights down, it's coming up. Okay. If you want the lights down, okay. you can all lights on and near dark, and then but always turn the stage and the board off because afterwards it's hard to see this light. Okay. One uh, interesting question that I like to sometimes ask on exams is uh, Lemire syndrome, because you'll see this occasionally, in which you get from an infection up in the head and neck, you can get thrombophlebitis of the internal jugular vein. And interestingly, that's nearly always due to the same organism. One of the anaerobes, the gram, long gram-negative toothpick that I showed you, Fusobacterium necrophorum, Fusobacterium, spindle shape. Retropharyngeal space infection can of the potential uh, fascial spaces back in the neck. You remember from your anatomy that the neck is about the most complicated area to dissect, right? You can get infection from contiguous infection of the lateral pharyngeal space, or you could have a, if, you, if the back of your throat was perforated by a fish bone or a chicken bone, bacteria could get in there. And because of the association of the retropharyngeal space uh, with the lateral pharyngeal space and, and the contents of the carotid sheath, you can get into big trouble. And I, I share this picture of the tooth just to remind you, this is what your dental students or uh, friends are studying, that infections in the tooth can lead to all kinds of bad things. And for final extra credit, what does this slide show? Who can diagnose that in the mouth? Excuse me? Thrush? No. But a good guess. Herpangina? That was a good guess, too. Those would be more like little blisters. This is blank person spots. I heard it. I heard it out there. Yes, yeah, that's, that's measles. With that, we'll break for ten minutes and, and then talk about lower respiratory tract infections.